from stink bugs to aphids to to the cicadas, this is the order Hemiptera. Welcome to the Insect Spotlight Project, a channel dedicated to shining a light on insects, spiders, and any other creepy crawlies that get left out of the ecologic spotlight. So today we're talking about the order Hemiptera, also known as the true bugs. Yes, you heard me correctly. There is an order of insects officially referred to as the bugs. Although bug is often used colloquially to refer to any sort of creepy crawly, the order Hemiptera are the true bugs. So if you want to sound really pompous, next time someone refers to some other insect as a bug, feel free to correct them. But let's still talk about how we identify a true bug from other insect orders. Remember in the beetle episode when we talked about elytra, the tough, hardened forewings of beetles that give them that tank-like appearance? Well, Hemiptera have hemilytra. Well, some of them have hemilytra. Hemilytra are wings that are thickened toward the front of the insect, and then membranous toward the tip of the wing at the back of the insect. So many Hemipterans will have hemilytra as the forewings, and then classic membranous hindwings. And as you might have been suspicious of, this is actually where their name comes from. Hemi means half, and terra means wing. So hemiptera means half wing. Consequently, hemilytra means half elytra. You'll find these on stink bugs, assassin bugs, leaf-footed bugs, and a whole lot more. But not all hemipterans have hemilytra. In fact, there are very diverse groups of hemiptera that completely lack it so we can't rely on this trait alone. One trait you can rely on is piercing-sucking mouthparts. Across all groups of Hemiptera, piercing-sucking mouthparts are standard. You've got to be careful though. Some other groups of insects have similar mouthparts, such as fleas and mosquitoes. And although weevils look like they have piercing-sucking mouthparts, they really just have chewing mouthparts at the end of a long proboscis. But in Hemiptera, Piercing-sucking mouthparts, also referred to as their rostrum or beak, are widespread, and you can find them in both the nymphs and the adults. I guess I should probably explain what a nymph is. So in past videos, you've heard me describe some orders as holometabolous, meaning they have a four-stage metamorphosis from egg to larvae to pupae to adult. Well, hemipterans are hemimetabolous, meaning they have an incomplete metamorphosis from egg to nymph to adult. So there's no pupil stage. Nymphs just, at one point or another, molt directly into their adult stage. Nymphs can sometimes look like their adult counterparts, but the easiest way to tell them apart is that nymphs are not yet going to have developed wings. So if you see wings, it's an adult. Though there are examples of wingless adults. Overall, Hemiptera can be tough to tell apart from other orders, so don't get discouraged. Just keep practicing and trust the process. Now, enough identification. One thing that makes Hemiptera so amazing is their ability to thrive in a variety of environments, most notably their ability to thrive in many aquatic systems. A ton of Hemipterans are perfectly at home in a pond or stream, such as this water skater or this giant water bug. And even more impressive is there's a group of Hemiptera that have adapted to live on the surface of the open ocean, far away from shore. And much to our dismay, many Hemipterans can also thrive on our crops. There's almost too many significant Hemipteran agricultural pests to go over in one video. From the larger bugs, such as the squash bugs, to the hoppers, such as the potato leaf hopper, to the tiny itty bitty pests like the aphids, white flies, and scales. I'm just gonna have to pick a group and run with it, so let's just talk about the aphids for a second. Aphids are not a species, but a whole group of insects in the family Aphididae. Like white flies and scales and a lot of other tiny insects, one thing that makes aphids so successful is their ability to reproduce at rapid rates. Aphids use a combination of sexual and asexual reproduction to really capitalize on food resources. Sometimes they take the time to grow wings and go find mates, and other times they just clone themselves over and over and over again. 
Many aphids don't even bother laying eggs. They just plop out a fully functioning mini-me, like 80 of them in a week. And sometimes those mini-me's are already pregnant with another mini-me. Things can get out of hand pretty quickly. Broadening it back out to all of Hemiptera, a lot of the damage from these pests is not directly caused by their feeding. The real damage is the diseases they spread along the way. As we talked about in the Diptera episode, mosquitoes and other blood-feeding insects can be very efficient vectors of disease. And these Hemipterans are basically plant vampires, piercing the veins of plants and sucking out their juices. So as logic would suggest, they're also very efficient vectors of plant diseases. One single species of whitefly, Benmissia tabassi, the silverleaf whitefly, spreads over a hundred different plant viruses and is believed to cost the United States agricultural industry hundreds of millions of dollars every year. Interestingly though, Hemiptera also contains a large number of important pest control agents, many of which are very efficient predators of the aphids and whiteflies. I mean, my entire master's research was focused on big-eyed bugs and minute pirate bugs because of their voracious appetite for whiteflies. Assassin bugs and damsel bugs can also play an important role in keeping pests under control. That was a really cute little rhyme that I did not intend to make. And in some instances, specialized herbivorous hemipterans have been released for the control of invasive weed populations. Also, many of those aquatic hemipteran species we talked about have a strong appetite for mosquito larvae. And not many insect predators would pass up a tasty cicada as a little snack. A great way to help local hemipteran populations is the planting of native flowers. A lot of these predatory hemipterans utilize flowers as their hunting grounds, and some hemipterans directly utilize nectar. Additionally, don't be afraid to layer your plantings. A native tree with native flowers at the base and native vines crawling around it can maximize impact and utilize the space efficiently, creating a buffet for a ton of local insects. Plus, the ground cover is critical to many groups, including the big-eyed bugs we talked about. And if you have water on your property, make sure it isn't just some pool of water with lawn grass all around it. That's like having a restaurant with no food inside. Having surrounding vegetation can create some shaded areas in the water for better temperature regulation, and also it creates an input of organic debris necessary for a thriving aquatic community. So remember, the hemipterans are the true bugs, while the large subset of them have hemilytra, those half-thickened forewings, all of them have piercing, sucking mouthparts. They're hemimetabolous, with a three-stage metamorphosis from egg to nymph to adult. Although many of them can be major pests due to their efficient vectoring of plant diseases, they are critical in terrestrial and aquatic ecosystems as predators, weed control agents, and as a food resource. You can help them through the planting of a wide variety of native flora. And if you've got any water on your property, make sure to put some native vegetation there too. Thank you all so much for listening, and I'll see you again soon. Peace.